What is up, everybody? This is Brad, and I've got a CGC reveal video for you today. And uh, we're going with the newer version of these videos where I don't actually have any new slabs in hand, but I'm going to go through some magazines with you that I um, pressed and cleaned and submitted for a customer. And uh, the, the slabs got returned, so I now have access to the grades and to the images. And so, you know, I just love talking about covers and seeing different magazines, seeing different covers and uh, talking through the details. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to share with you six of these magazines that uh, were sent back to my customer. We're going to start with this first one that you can already see here. And this is Sport Magazine. This is from 1948. And that is Joe Lewis, the Brown Bomber, legendary boxer. And uh, 1948, that's going back a ways on the sports magazines. Of course, Sports Illustrated didn't even launch until 1954. So uh, Sport Magazine preceded that. And uh, Joe Lewis, you know, he's not talked about as much anymore, somewhat forgotten, but he was big time. He was major. He was the heavyweight champion from, listen to this, 1937 through 1949. That's over like a 13-year span that that the Brown Bomber Joe Lewis was the heavyweight champ of the world. He was victorious in 25 consecutive title defenses. That is insane. That's a record for all weight classes still. Um, and he's got the longest single reign as a champion of any boxer in the history of the sport. So, uh, yeah, once again, massive athlete, one of the greatest boxers of all time. And I think this is a great looking magazine cover. Sport doesn't get nearly as much love as Sports Illustrated, but, uh, you know, in many cases, I think that it should. So let's see here. Um, this got a 7.5. I projected a 6. Um, I'm always very conservative when I project magazines, especially for other customers, because I want everyone to, you know, be pleasantly surprised. Uh, you can see the grading notes up here. Brittleness, chipping, top of interior. Um, I'll say from experience, that's very common on some of these old sport magazines. You definitely start getting some brittleness, moderate spine stress, and some staple rust. And let's see if I can uh, enlarge this picture just a little bit for you to see. Um, so Sport Magazine, if you're not familiar, um, in this era, they were bound differently than what most of the Sports Illustrated's were. You know, most of the Sports Illustrated's had your three staples right on the side of the spine, but Sport Magazine had staples on the interior, had, had a glued spine, but it also had some staples on the interior. Um, and so you actually, usually, whenever you press these magazines, you can kind of see the indentations of where those uh, staples are. Okay, there we go. Finally, I was about, I was about to give up, but uh, we got it just in time. So here is, here's that cover. Very nice. Look, you can see there's where one of the staples are. I mean, overall, this is in pretty nice shape for a magazine from 1948. Um, you know, here is uh, maybe a little bit of some of the spine uh, issues that it's talking about. There's there's the other staple and you can actually, I think it listed some staple rust. You can even see a tiny bit of that rust maybe showing through there, but uh, overall this one displays beautifully. Uh, a couple references to Hall of Famers Mel Ott and Bob Feller and uh, yeah, very nice magazine. There's the back, Chesterfield cigarettes advertisement. So uh Pretty cool, Joe Lewis. Um, this is a Pop 2 with only one graded higher. There have only been five copies of this issue graded all together. So 7.5, uh, in my opinion, strong grade for the year 1948. All right, let's move on to number two. And this one's unique. This is not sports. This one is very cool. Look at this, Rock and Roll Stars. And we've got Elvis Presley from 1956. A uh, very cool cover. Very, very cool cover. I projected this at a four, came back at a 5.5. So I think that's uh, two for two in uh, projections coming back at a 1.5 higher grade than what I predicted. Uh, so 1956, uh, was actually the first year, or it was it was the year of Elvis's first RCA single and number one song, which was Heartbreak Hotel. So this is this is not just an Elvis cover; it's a very early Elvis cover. Because uh, like I said, this this came out the same year as his first single. 
Um, Elvis ended up with 18 number ones, which is third most all time behind only the Beatles and Mariah Carey. He ended up dying in 1977, only at the age of 42, most likely because of drugs. Although if you ask some, he might still be out there. Um, this is the only copy of this issue graded. Um, there's some other people listed on the back. Hopefully if, if this starts taking as long as the last one did, I'll probably close out. And yeah, it's not, it's not going too quickly. Um, let's see if I can see. So you got Elvis, um, Bill Haley, uh, little Willie Johns, uh, Laverne Baker. I wasn't really familiar with any of those folks, but, um, yeah, I think this is a pretty cool magazine cover. I think that, uh, I think my friend, made a good choice in picking this one up and sending it in to be submitted as the only copy of this magazine that has been graded. All right, moving on to number three. And, uh, oh, you know what? Let's let's check real quick at, the, at some of the graders' notes. I think this is good education for some people interested in this hobby, just to kind of see some of the things you can get deductions for. Little bit of creasing on the cover. You can you can definitely see that here on the back. There's there's a nice crease there, and and when it breaks color like that, uh, you know you can flatten it out, but pressing is and cleaning is not going to fix that issue. Some fingerprints on the cover, very common for for magazines from this era. Uh, you know the the fingerprint oils become so old they almost become like embedded. Sometimes they even look like paint uh, on the cover. Some soiling on the cover. That's just kind of like some browning. I can maybe even see a little bit here, like on the A. Uh, spine stress, of course, common error. Some light water stain on the cover. Very small chip out of the right top back of cover. So that'd be somewhere over here. Looks like this might be the chip right there. So there's some of the greater notes why it got a 5.5, but hey, this magazine's from 1956. Okay, love this cover. This is cover number three. This, in my, uh, this in my opinion, is a very underrated cover. And this is Wilt Chamberlain. This is from 1965. This is the second time that Wilt the Stilt was on the cover of Sports Illustrated. His first cover was in 1961, I believe. And he was sharing the cover with his coach at the time. And actually the coach kind of was in the forefront of, of that cover. Uh, Wilt was a little bit more in the background. And so I like to think of this cover here as Wilt's first solo cover which is why, in my opinion, it's a little bit underrated. It's a really nice shot of Wilt. Um, I projected this one at a five, so this one actually came right on the head for what I had predicted. Um, there have been 12 copies of this one graded. This is a newsstand, and uh, that's that's the newsstand count, 12 newsstand copies graded. This is a pop one with eight copies graded higher, and uh, I actually own a copy of this, which I think... Uh, I think mine might be a 5.5. I know mine's not a, a high grade. It's a mid grade like this one. And uh, yeah, the, the cover says my life in a Bush league. I remember first time that I saw this uh, cover. I was interested in what that meant. So I actually looked up the article and I read the article and it, it was an article written by Wilt Chamberlain. And he was basically just descri describing the NBA and he was really calling the NBA out for a variety of things. And he was literally calling it a Bush League. Uh, I know he was talking a lot about the coaches and how, you know, it was like all white coaches and it was kind of like a good old boys club. And a lot of the coaches didn't know what they were talking about. And there were lots of other things. I think he was maybe talking about some of the way that the fans treated him. Uh, very interesting article and a very cool cover. Also, I love that you've got the rim there kind of in the, you know, out of focus, but at the very front of that cover image. Really cool cover. Um, let's see, what else here? So I do have a couple sales to share on this one. The previous ones, I didn't have any previous sales history. But uh, this cover has sold as a subscription graded at 6.5 for $225 this year. So that tells you, you know, that people definitely think this is a collectible cover. If you've got a 6.5 subscription selling for $225, that's pretty strong. An 8.0 newsstand copy of this one sold last year in 2023 for $600. So, uh, yeah, really, really like this cover. Cover. couple graders notes on this one. There was a little bit of a water stain on both the cover and the interior. 
not really much you can ever do with those. Uh, pressing will sometimes help them not be as noticeable, but CGC usually still catches it if there's a little bit of water damage. Uh, a little bit of creasing to cover. You know, I can see some of that up here in that top left corner. Definitely can see some here. These are also some large spine ticks. That would be the spine stress lines. And then it also says there are some some uh, spine splits to the cover. So that would be right on the side of the, the spine, which we can't see. Uh, you know, usually it happens a lot on the top and the bottom or maybe right around the staples where the front cover and the back cover have uh, just slightly come apart. All right. So that's number three. Let's move on to number four. And we're moving to 1971. And we've got two NBA Hall of Famers on this one. And that would be Willis Reed for the New York Knicks and uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, still known on this cover as Lou Alcindor. And uh, Knicks versus Bucks preview of the playoffs. Now, I projected this one at a 6.5. Coming in at a three, this one was one that really was a head scratcher. Although I will say, looking through the, the notes, you've got some cover tanning. Uh, tanning is where over time it kind of starts to darken a little bit. You can definitely see some examples of that on the back cover where, you know, in some sections it's it's bright white, but then a little more like around the edges, it's a little bronzish. That's tanning. Creasing to cover, some fading to cover, very common from these this era. Uh, where you get some fading over over the decades. Um, spine stress lines, of course, pretty normal. I can see a couple here. The the uh, the spine splits, I think, you know, is is what got me. Um, you know, if there's major spine splits, that will get you pretty heavy deductions. And I just wonder if maybe, you know, in the shipping or in the unpackaging, maybe some of those, maybe there were a couple small spine splits that spread because that is very easy to happen. And uh, that's the only thing I can think of that would have brought this down from my projection of a 6.5 to a 3.0 because it does say heavy spine splits. And, uh, you know, my recollection was not heavy spine splits that there were minor spine splits. So my thought is maybe some of those spine splits started to spread and that's definitely something that can happen. You got to realize these are real people handling and grading your magazines. And, you know, the the condition that you send your magazines in over the shipping and unpackaging and encapsulation process, unfortunately, doesn't always mean that's going to be the exact same condition that ends in, that it ends up in. It does and can happen for a little more damage to happen. And, and that's my only guess on how, I mean, I could be totally off base. Maybe I just did a terrible job of projecting this one, but I mean, I will say that doesn't really usually happen. So thought that was odd that this one came in a three, but still a great cover nonetheless. Um, they didn't label it this way. I don't believe let's let this load for just a second, but I believe this is Willis Reed's first cover. Um, I think, am I, am I wrong on that? I don't know. Let's, let's double check and look together while we're both here. If you don't utilize this website, Highly recommend it, sportsillustratedissues.com. It's it's ran and owned by just a fan collector, and it's but it is the most comprehensive database out there. Okay, so I was incorrect. Definitely not his first cover. We got Willis Reed uh, as a human appearing on three covers and appearing on four covers if you count this uh, this jersey. And you know, oddly enough, it looks like three of the four covers are Willis Reed and and Kareem Abdul Jabbar. Uh, his first cover from 1969 is definitely not a very nice looking cover. I'm actually not sure what even's going on here. You got this red light and red glare. Uh, I'm assuming that was intentional, but I uh, can't say that I really like that cover very much. Got Billy Cunningham and Dave DeBusher. I believe those are two Hall of Famers as well. So anyway, uh, this cover that we're looking at right here is not Willis Reed's first cover. Um, so excuse me for, um, insinuating that it might be, there have been, let's see here, 10 copies of this issue graded. This is a pop one with nine higher. So it is the lowest graded out of 10. The highest is a 9.2 Willis Reed. Um, let's see. He was a Hall of Famer, seven-time All-Star, two-time NBA champ, uh, two-time Finals MVP. Of course, most famously known for you know coming back out of the locker room and playing through the injury. 
He was also the 1970 regular season MVP. Um, the only sales I could find for this one were that a 3.5 newsstand, very comparable to this one, sold for $80, and a 5.5 sold for $100. All right, let's move on to issue number five, and we're going to check out this. Oh, yeah, love the Muhammad Ali, love the vintage Muhammad Ali. Um, this is from 1965, uh, Muhammad Ali and Sonny Liston. I believe this was Ali and Liston part two. Yes, this was the second battle. And you know what's interesting is Muhammad Ali, after he defeated Sonny Liston the first time in, I believe, 1964 and, you know, shocked the world to become, to upset Liston and to become the heavyweight champion. It was right after that, I think just within a week or two, if not the same day, I don't, I don't remember, but very, very close to after he won that first fight that he changed his name, he announced his cha name changed to Muhammad Ali. But he was, he was on a lot of covers in the 60s, a lot of Sports Illustrated covers, and Sports Illustrated still for a long time continued to reference him as Cassius Clay. Uh, they almost like wouldn't acknowledge that he had changed his name. Now, it doesn't look like this particular cover even has his name listed anywhere. Uh, but I guarantee you that if you were to read the articles on the interior from this magazine in 1965, um, you would see exactly what I'm talking about. They would have been referring to him as Cassius Clay. And in fact, let's just go back and let's take a look at some of his covers from that era. And you're going to see exactly what I'm talking about. Let's go back into the 60s. And so here we go. Um, this was the first time he knocked out uh, Sonny Liston in 1964. And then you can see sub, sub, subsequent covers uh, can Clay do it again? Uh, here you go. In 1965, Clay versus Patterson. Um, 1967, Clay versus Terrell. And then here you go. Finally, in 1967, uh, the scramble for Ali's title. And, and even in this 1969 issue, it says Ali slash Clay. So, uh, yeah, Sports Illustrated uh, kind of took a while to, to convert over. And I think actually that that wasn't uncommon. You know, a lot of people kind of pushed back on that change and, uh, you know, the black Muslim and, and all that stuff. But anyway, this is a very cool cover from Ali Liston part two. The first time that they fought was in February of 1964. And uh, that was in Miami Beach. And like I said, Clay was a huge underdog. He was actually an eight to one underdog. He won the upset. Um, and then when the champion gave up at the opening, or I'm sorry, he, he won that because uh, Sonny Liston gave up at the opening of, this, of the seventh round. Their second fight, which is this cover, happened on May 25th, 1965. That happened in Lewiston, Maine, and Ali won that one with a first round knockout. Uh, however, there was some controversy on that one. Um, some people labeled it as the phantom punch. Um, saying that the punch that knocked out Liston shouldn't have actually knocked him out and, um, you know, claiming that the fight was thrown or the fight was fixed. Um, also, there was a botched count by the referee, which aroused some suspicions. And, you know, it's it's been subject for debate ever since, um, you know, whether or not Ali truly knocked out Liston. But you know what? I'm a big Ali guy and I'm going to say it was legit. So I projected a 5.5 on this one, came back with a 6.5. Uh, there have been seven copies of this one graded. And this is a pop one with five higher. The highest is an 8.5. Sales on this one, the only one I could find is that a 3.0 newsstand sold in 2021 for $125. I absolutely love this cover image. Grader's notes said some creasing to cover. Um, I can see a little crease going right down there that breaks color, finger bends on cover, light scuffing to cover, soiling on cover, spine stress lines to cover. Um, you, you can kind of see like this almost color fading right here. I still don't know how CGC even categorizes that. I don't know if that's what they're calling soiling or light scuffing, um, but that's just such a common flaw on these issues from the 60s and 70s that the, the color just kind of starts fading 
uh, exactly like that. So, all right, let's look at the last one, last but not least, definitely not least. Look at this absolute stunner right here. I have to say, when this one came back, when this one popped, and I saw it in my submission box, I was absolutely stoked for my customer. Uh, I mean, and I mean, even more so because I'm a St. Louis Cardinals fan, lifelong huge St. Louis Cardinals fan. Stan the Man 9.8. From 1954, what a freaking stunner. This is beautiful. I mean, you guys, you don't just get 9.8s from 1954 unless it's issue number one that they, you know, saved in a warehouse and sold as commemorative items uh, of Sports Illustrated. But a sport magazine, 9.8 from 1954, that's epic. That's legendary. I knew this one was nice. I projected a 9.0. But wow, coming back in 9.8 is phenomenal. Just absolutely gorgeous. Um, and in fact, I believe my friend um, who I sent this back to is putting this issue on heritage auctions. I don't know when, but uh, I believe that it, is, that it is his plan. So if you like this one, uh, be watching on heritage and you know you can you can have an opportunity to snag it I'd, I'd love to see this one sell for at least several thousand dollars i mean in my opinion it should so uh stan the man hall of famer 24 time all-star of course a couple of those years there were two all-star games so i think it's more like he was a 20 year all-star or maybe 21 year all-star something like that still insane three-time mvp three-time world series champ he won seven batting titles um, he had over 3,600 hits, which is fourth all time. And that's even with missing the whole 1945 season for military service, which was his age 24 season probably would have put up some major numbers. Uh, in fact, he finished with 475 career home runs. Good chance he would have been in the 500 home run club if he hadn't uh, missed out. But you know, that's, uh, obviously very honorable of Stan Musial to serve in 1945 uh, in World War II during his age 24 season, you know, likely his prime. Uh, and Stan was an honorable guy. I remember at one point later in his career, he, I think, I don't know if he actually did, but he offered to take a pay cut. I think he did actually take a pay cut. Um, he like returned some of his salary to the Cardinals because he felt like he underperformed and didn't have a good year. That's the kind of guy that Stan Musial was. How about this little fact? He was born November 21st in Denora, Pennsylvania. That is the same date and same town that Ken Griffey Jr. was born. Ken Griffey Jr. was also born November 21st in Denora, Pennsylvania. By the way, Denora, Pennsylvania has a population of 4,000 people. Of course, they were born 49 years apart. Stan Musial was born 49 years earlier on November 21st. But how about that? The same day, the same tiny little town, two of the all-time greats, probably two of the 15 or 20 greatest baseball players of all time, maybe even top 10, could be argued, we're born in that same little town on the same day. I think that's pretty cool. So this sport magazine issue has been graded nine times. And of course, this beautiful 9.8 is a pop one with none graded higher. I love when I get that little top pop symbol right there on the CGC website. And uh, we're going to try and zoom in on this one just a little bit just to admire the beauty a little bit more. Um, I got a relish on this 9.8 because I've never had a 9.8 from, from this long ago. I'm trying to think, you know, for me personally, my personal collection, what my oldest 9.8 is, I don't even think, uh, I don't even know if I've got a, a 9.8 from the eighties, you know, let alone the fifties. So, man, don't we have some, uh, don't we have some. There we go. That looks better. I didn't want to get too close, but I wanted to have a little bit more of a zoom in than what we had before. Stan Musial cover. Volume 16, number six. Nice 9.8. Just great. Just a beauty. Just a stunner. And you got some, I don't know, mystery novels on the back. So there you go. That is it, folks.
that's the batch for today. So I hope you enjoyed that. I'll have some more of these magazines coming because like I've said, I've I've really slowed my own submissions. I haven't submitted my own in uh, maybe a month or two now, um, largely because of time. Uh, I just have not had time. I've been busy. I have I have tons of raw magazines that I want to send in. I just I just haven't done it. And then I'm also kind of waiting to see what happens with PSA. I'm kind of on hold. I I think I've got one more batch with CGC um, that I for sure am wanting to send in. They're already pressed, and I just need to get around to packaging them and sending them in. That's probably going to be my last submission with CGC until PSA comes out. And once PSA comes out with their magazine grading. I'm not saying I'm going to be strictly PSA, um, but I'm going to send into PSA and, and see how I like it. And then I will kind of decide, you know, which team I'm going to be on, which direction I'm going to go moving forward. Maybe I'll use both. Don't know yet to be seen, but it's exciting that they're coming in. So anyway, hope you enjoyed this video. Um, if you've not yet done so, please subscribe to this channel. I appreciate likes and comments. And until the next video, I'll see you guys next time.